Why did the bacteria cross the road? Well, that's because it can't see red and green lights, duh. That would probably make them very bad self-driving cars though. But what if I told you there was a way to control these bacteria using a bit of engineering? The more you look into it, the more you might find that these tiny organisms share a very interesting trait with something that us humans have also made, the PID controller. Coincidence? Intellectual theft? Maybe a little bit of both. It's a mystery we'll solve together. So join me as we uncover why and how a man-made invention like a PID controller shows up in bacteria of all places. And at the end of it all, we'll hack these bacterial controllers into doing something really cool. Let's get started. Diving into something closer to our daily lives, drones are an excellent example of systems that utilize PID controllers. If we are to unravel this mystery, we must become familiar with our prime suspect. Consider this section as a briefing to help us identify the culprit. Specifically, in bacteria, the controller we're dealing with is just one component of the PID system, the I, or integral, controller. Drones, for instance, need to maintain a stable hover position against the downward force of gravity. Without the integral controller, the drone would find itself in a constant struggle between gravity and its propellers. It would be trapped between its starting point and a desired altitude, resulting in what engineers refer to as steady state error. If we were to plot the distance to the target over time, most controllers would simply see a flat line and consider the job done, but not the integral controller. It takes the area under that flat line and accumulates it, translating that accumulation into the motor's effort. The accumulation eventually builds up, allowing the motor to break free from the trap. Thus, the integral controller operates by exerting effort based on the accumulated error over time, making it highly effective in addressing steady state errors. Remember this. Now that we have identified a culprit, let's investigate the crime scene. Bacteria require energy to survive. They lack the ability to perceive red or green lights or even hear the sound of car engine for that matter. In fact, they can't even see. Instead, bacteria possess the remarkable capability to move towards sources of food based on chemical signals, a process known as chemotaxis. Chemo meaning chemical and taxis meaning movement. However, like many aspects of life, there are complications involved, particularly in the form of noise. Bacteria experience thermal noise and local noise that can interfere with their chemotaxis abilities. To solve this, bacteria move by running in straight lines and tumbling in short sporadic bursts. They tumble more frequently to randomly search for the direction of food, while they run more often when they have a higher level of certainty about the location of the food. What I'm emphasizing here is that the integrator is not just a part of chemotaxis, it plays an integral role in the process. Haha, <laughs> yes, very funny. So. Let's continue our investigation to uncover the reasons behind this phenomenon. To understand the intricate details of chemotaxis, we can draw inspiration from engineers and their approach to testing system responses based on simple inputs. Rather than complicating things with fancy simulations of complex gradients, simplicity often provides the best insights into studying any system. In our case, we will use a step input as the simple input for our experiment. This involves stepping up the input and holding it steady, hence the name. The response to this input is known as the step response. And the response we are looking for is how often the bacteria tumbles, also known as the tumbling frequency. To conduct the experiment, we place the bacteria in a plate of water and simultaneously open up all the floodgates, ensuring that every bacterium experiences the same condition. Initially, there is a significant reduction in the bacteria's tumbling frequency. However, as time progresses, a surprising phenomenon occurs. The bacteria start tumbling more and more until it appears as if nothing has changed. 
it is truly remarkable how the bacteria is able to not be fooled into running everywhere. This is what biologists refer to as exact adaptation. This can potentially be the clue that we've been looking for. Let's continue our investigation and delve deeper into the control panel of this system. Here, we encounter a circuit with a specific purpose to use the external chemical signal as an input and control the tumbling frequency as the output. The Y protein in this case serves as the communicator of the circuit's output, and it can be turned off by Z and turned on by X. It is the X protein that connects to the receptor responsible for detecting the attractant chemical. As the signal intensity increases, X is turned off, leading to the inhibition of Y. This response aligns with the bacteria's behavior of tumbling less frequently and continuing on in the correct direction when a correct attractant is detected. This circuit may potentially serve as an integrator as the accumulation of the signal adds up to decrease the activity of Y. This is very reminiscent of what an integral does. But our exploration is not complete just yet. There is another crucial component of this system that could provide more clues to us. The receptor itself possesses a unique characteristic. It is tunable. It contains slots for chemical modifications known as methylations, which can alter the sensitivity of the sensor itself. Increasing the number of methyl groups reduces the sensor's sensitivity, while reducing methyl groups enhances the sensitivity. The control of methylation is governed by R and B proteins, with R adding methyl groups and B removing them. However, there is an asymmetry in this control system. When X is activated, it also activates B. Now, let's put all the pieces together and trace the cascade of events when a signal is sent in. The attractant lowers the X protein level, which subsequently reduces B and Y activation, resulting in a lower tumbling frequency. With no mechanism to remove the methyl groups, R continues to add more, decreasing the sensor sensitivity and promoting further X activation. The increased X activation leads to more Y activation, causing the cell to tumble more frequently. And it is this intricate interplay of these components that generates the exact adaptation response we observed earlier. Now that I've provided you with all the clues, I challenge you this. Take a guess. Where do you think the integrator lies in this fascinating control system? If your answer is the methylation of the receptor, then you're spot on. Or are you? Well, you might argue that the integrator works by adding the error over time, right? The signal introduces a substantial error into the system that would have persisted if it's not corrected. The only way to eliminate this error is by increasing X's activation. The effort the controller exerts is dependent on the number of methyl groups attached to the vast sea of receptors on the bacteria. I agree, this explanation seems logical. But what if methylation alone isn't sufficient to restore X and the tumbling frequency to their original levels? This is the steady state error we've encountered before. If methylation truly acted as the integrator, it should not lead to this issue. So how does the system determine the appropriate level of effort to exert, such that it doesn't cause the steady state error? We could continue debating different interpretations based on biological intuition indefinitely. However, we have a tool that can transform intuitions and assumptions into concrete details. Mathematics. Let's settle this once and for all using math. First, we need to establish one crucial fact. The steady state level of X, which controls this tumbling frequency, remains constant regardless of signal strength. If this is true, then a steady state error is impossible since X always returns to the same steady state. By examining experimental observations, we can make two assumptions about the methylation process. The methylation caused by R is independent of the number of receptors. This is because R is scarce and operates at such a low pace. So methylation slots seem like a bottomless well to it. Demethylation caused by B only occurs when X is in the on state. 
the on state of X exposes the receptor's methylation to B. Combining these two assumptions, we can derive a differential equation that describes how methylation changes over time. When the system returns to its normal state, methylation should cease since there is no more error to be corrected. Therefore, in this condition, the system reaches equilibrium, everything is in steady state. So we can set dm by dt to zero and solve for x steady state. And there you have it, you can observe that x steady state does not depend on the input whatsoever. However, some of you might still harbor some healthy skepticism. Sure, it has the ability to return to a set point, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is an integral controller. It could have been any other type of controller. And to that, I'll say, watch this. We substitute x steady state into the equation, solve for methylation. And after a few algebraic steps and integrating both sides, you can see that this equation represents integral control. The methylation serves as the effort exerted by the controller, while the error represents the difference between the steady state x and the current x value. Look at how effortlessly this emerged. Nature truly is remarkable, isn't it? But still, why does it show up there? And how do we even use this fact? But for now, to enjoy the fruits of our labor, we have an animation showcasing the controller in action. Let's take a look. Now that we've witnessed how this all comes together, let's put this knowledge to practical use. Let's hack the controller of these bacteria so that they possess some quirky characteristics. And then after that, we'll answer why this controller shows up in nature. Some of them can be jittery and nervous, constantly moving around. And some of them can be more assured, tumbling only occasionally. These quirks aren't just for amusement, they serve a purpose. The more nervous bacteria excel in environments with numerous obstacles and solid nooks and crannies. On the other hand, the more certain ones thrive in liquid environments. Typically, a bacterial population spawns with variations spanning these two extremes, allowing individuals to have their chance at life. How does nature achieve this variation? Well, it's because the tumbling frequency is incredibly easy to alter. If we examine the mathematics we've just explored, we find that the steady state value of x depends on the levels of R and B. Therefore, if there are more R molecules, the x steady state increases, leading to an increase in default tumbling frequency, assuming B remains constant, of course. We don't have to wait for nature to perform these tunings, we can directly control our levels to modify tumbling according to our requirements. This isn't just a hypothetical scenario, it has been accomplished before. Actual experimental data supports these findings. More details can be found in the linked paper below and the book chapter itself. Taking a broader perspective, chemotaxis is an incredibly powerful ability possessed by some cells. Certain immune cells, for example, employ chemotaxis to track their targets. It's as if these cells are scent-guiding homing missiles. Pretty remarkable, isn't it? Those who find this concept fascinating did not waste any time in harnessing this ability. By using a 3D printed structure made of hydrogel, you can guide the bacteria to specific locations in your structure employing chemotaxis. Furthermore, even at this high level of design, you can control the speed at which the bacteria moves towards the target by fine-tuning the tumbling frequency. It's an astonishingly versatile ability with numerous applications. And so, we come to the question of why a PID controller manifests in bacteria. Honestly, we don't have a definitive answer. Yet. However, this is just one strategy that nature has developed to address a broader challenge. Homeostasis. Homeostasis refers to the ability of an organism to maintain stability and sustain life. Whether that's regulating body temperature, moving muscles to a specific point or speed, or determining when to tumble instead of run. 
all of these tasks are more effectively accomplished through the involvement of a feedback control loop. It's reasonable to assume that there is an evolutionary pressure to devise mechanisms to tackle problems related to homeostasis. This realization highlights that our inventions may not be as unique as we have often believed. It paints a story that nature has pioneered so many concepts long before our time on this very earth. Personally, this is one of the reasons why I became captivated and fascinated by the study of systems biology. It's not only about comprehending nature, but also gleaning incredibly rich insights from nature. And with the aid of mathematics, we can transform those insights and intuitions into tangible, actionable conclusions. Conclusions that might just convince you to feel inspired to invent new things. Thank you immensely for watching.